I was brought up an anti-racist. I've been an anti-racist all my life. I will die an anti-racist. And to falsely accuse somebody of any kind of racism is a major dishonest and dishonorable thing to do. I accepted and welcomed the HRC report. I accepted and welcomed the need for rule change to implement the HRC report. I said that there had been cases where the degree of anti-Semitism had been exaggerated for political purposes. I didn't want the public out there to think that the whole Labour Party was riddled with racists and anti-Semites. It's not. And it has sparked Corbynism. All the arguments for socialism are stronger than ever. Jeremy Corbyn, hello. Hello. How, How are, are you doing? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> grand. Absolutely grand. Today, MPs are in Parliament swearing in. New oath of allegiance to King Charles. We're in your office. What's the story going on? You're not, swear you're not swearing in yourself? Uh, there's no need to. The um, oath that is taken at the start of each parliament was to the last one, the Queen Elizabeth II, and her heirs and successors according to law. No need for you to The do law that. has been followed. <laughs> so you've met the Queen, I'm right in saying, obviously. Yeah, many times. You meet Charles? Yes. What was he like? Um, interesting. Very long conversations with him, mainly about environment issues and um, issues of young people, education, craft education, and um, his views on environment and sustainability. Very well thought out, very well informed. And um, I found it actually an interesting conversation. Yeah, his views on uh, environmental issues are well known. He's been obviously known as well to write to government ministers and express what he thinks as well as having conversations with Well, that's the problematic area. Because uh, if you've got an unelected head of state, as we have, then that position means that they're a titular head of state. They're no more or less than that. But if you look at the real way our constitution operates, it isn't quite as simple as it appears. Um, Tony Benn always used to tell me that if you look at the order of precedence on the procession on the state opening of Parliament, he said that is the British Constitution in operation, which is why he put forward his Commonwealth of Britain bill many years ago, which I supported, and worked with him on it. So, um, yeah, there have to be changes, and it's a difficult one because you, you want to take on board everybody's point of view, but should somebody because they're a member of the royal family, have unfettered access to every minister, or should they be part of the same democratic process as everybody else? I'm the Democrat here. Yeah, I was chatting to Peter Hitchens last week, and he's a, he's a monarchist, he believes in constitutional monarchy, and his main counter-argument to sort of republicanism to me was he insisted that the monarch has no power, which I think is perhaps a contentious. I, I hesitate to disagree with Peter Hitchens because I know, <laughs> because I, I well know the consequences of it. <laughs> but uh, I have to say I do disagree with him on this because the um, the crown does have quite a lot of residual power. I mean, the most famous case was that, of course, of uh, Gough Whitlam being removed as Prime Minister of Australia in 1975 um, on the basis that he couldn't get his budget, his finance legislation, through both chambers of the Australian Parliament. And he was then removed as Prime Minister on the basis he didn't enjoy the confidence of Parliament. And um, somebody else was put in as Prime Minister to replace him. Now, that was done by the head of state, the Queen was the head of state of both Australia and of Britain. And that is the classic case, in my view, that needs a lot of examination. There's also the question of the royal prerogative. Essentially, the royal prerogative is held by the prime minister on behalf of the monarch um, on day-to-day -day basis. Interesting questions have to arise from that. And so, a constitutional monarch would be solely that, a, a head of state whose job was to be the um, non-political representative of the country, or does in fact the role of the Privy Council and of other things actually have quite an important part to play in this. These things have to be examined and I mm. suspect um, over the next few years 
um, as Charles begins to assert himself as the head of state, that this debate is going to intensify and it's going to be an, inter an, in an interesting one because um, I want to live in a democratic society and uh, I don't believe we do. Yeah, I think if you're going to insist that the monarch has no power, it brings the question perhaps what the purpose of royal assent is. But then also you look at, well, exactly, what is the purpose of royal assent and also this back to the issue of the royal prerogative. I attempted um, several occasions to um, make decisions made under the royal prerogative by the Prime Minister or other Secretaries of State subject to parliamentary approval. And I remember raising this with Margaret Beckett in uh, after the 97 election uh, on this, thinking that she might have some latent democratic ideas there. And she just very firmly, because I was backbench over here and she's down here, turned around and says, no. Full stop. My honourable friend is wrong. No. End of. There was no debate about it. You, you've, you've mentioned the word democracy a couple of times. In your view, is that the best case for republicanism? Not the only one, no. Um, there are a lot of issues to be debated, but I think we need to debate the issues of a democratic society, which is actually not the same thing as uh, changing the head of state. There are two things here. Um, and that is democratising our society, democratising our constitution and democratising our parliament. I'll give you another example. If um, a crisis happens during a parliamentary recess, as they often do, the only person that can authorise the recall of parliament is the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is supposed to be accountable to parliament. So he's account meant to be accountable to the body that he can decide whether it meets or not. Boris Johnson more than overstepped the mark in 2019 and eventually the Supreme Court found against him and Parliament had to be recalled. The Supreme Court were very unwilling to intervene on that. We demanded the recall of Parliament and this nonsense of a very long um, interregnum, if you like, between the end of one session and the start of a new session was Johnson's way of basically governing on his own, which the Supreme Court rather surprisingly intervened on uh, in favour of those of us that thought Parliament should be um, recalled. We weren't party to the case itself, although I authorised Shami Chakrabarti to enjoin herself in the case as Shadow Attorney General, which she, which she did. And so there's that issue. The other one is this, which you probably weren't aware of. If the opposition put down a motion tomorrow saying, for example, that corporation tax should be set at 26%, just suppose, two things would happen. One is the motion probably wouldn't be accepted by the um, Speaker and the clerks on the basis that um, it would be for the government to decide on taxation proposals and the government would have to bring it forward. And secondly, if they did accept it and it was carried and agreed, the next thing you'd find is that um, the government would say, well, it cannot be bound by any decision of Parliament that's on the basis of an opposition proposal. So the only way a government can be bound is by a government proposals or an amendment to a government proposal. So once again, the House of Commons is not the separate, independent, free democratic body that the traditional constitution is, possibly even our friend Peter Hitchens would think it is. I hesitate to get into an argument with him because I know how long it's going to take. Um, but um, it is in need of a great deal of, of reform. And I think that that debate about democracy in our society is something that's going to go on. But then there's also the wider issues about class discrimination and class distinction within our society. You look at the wholly disproportionate number of privately educated people that end up in Parliament, privately educated people that end up running a judiciary, privately educated people that end up running all of our national institutions, and privately educated people that end up dominating music and arts in this country because the private schools spend far more on creative education than any state school does, far more opportunities for them, and also that 
network of that sort of golden triangle of um, the senior civil service Oxford and Cambridge uh, ends up uh, being very, very powerful. When Robin Cook was Foreign Secretary, he was appalled at what he found. And to his credit, he acted very quickly to change the recruitment criteria in the Foreign Office. I used to give um, lectures on the workings of Parliament to um, young diplomats in the Foreign Office. It was actually was very interesting to do. Actually, the discussion was more interesting probably than what I had to say to them. But nevertheless, it was very interesting. And I just noticed within months of um, Ro uh, Robin becoming Foreign Secretary, the recruitment criteria changed and you suddenly had large numbers of recruits from um, what euphemistically called red brick or new universities as opposed to Oxbridge and much more diverse group of people. It was really interesting. And I meet those now who are sort of now middle ranking or above in the diplomatic service. Fascinating. But that again is democracy. So yes. Democracy is about equality of opportunity. Um, democracy is about um, respecting everyone within our society. Our society doesn't. Why have we got food banks? Why have we got homeless people? Why have we got s a mental health crisis brought about by stress, by poverty, by debt, by discrimination? Why have we got a young man shot on the streets of London 10 days ago and the media saying precious little about it because it was during the period of national mourning for the, uh, for the Queen. Well, OK, fair enough. Let's have the national mourning. But life doesn't stop. Mm. And uh, that man's family, and that's why I went to the demonstration um, in support of Chris Carver last Saturday. And you know what? The tweet I sent out had more than three million views in two days. I was going to ask you if events over the last two weeks, the death of the Queen, had changed how you felt about monarchy or republicanism, but it actually sounds like it's intensified your, your Well, you've got to victory. separate the individual from the office. I mean, at a personal level, I met the Queen on a number of occasions, and we had some quite nice chats, actually. Jam making. Jam, gardening, plants, natural world, wildlife, and it was lovely, mm. you know. And she was, um, and she'd clearly been well briefed on me. <laughs> In what sense? Oh! Where is your allotment? How big is it? What do you grow there? What are you growing this year? Mm. And it was actually quite nice because then if you start with a, something you're both interested in, you can then morph into um, wider conversations. But I mean, you've got to separate the issue of the individual. I remember Tony Benn saying once, we were at a, a meeting somewhere and the meeting was supposedly about his Governance of Britain, Democracy Bill, and so on, Commonwealth of Britain Bill. And that was fine. And um, then somebody gets up and starts being really, really rude about the Queen. Really rude. And Tony said, The issue's a dish. Well, he, there was a, no smoking coming by then, which Tony never agreed with. So, well, the issues are this um, She didn't ask for the job, but she does her best with the job that she's been given. And remember, Tony Benn and her had some quite interesting conversations. The best part is when he was Postmaster General in 64, in the Wilson government, he then decided to introduce some stamps without the Queen's head on it to demonstrate British democracy. You know, so there was going to be ships, there was going to be planes, there was going to be trees, there was going to be presumably poets and writers and so on and so on and so on. Anyway, Tony had sort of thought this thing through quite a lot. And he even went so far as to get them all designed. So he had all these mock-up stamps made on a big, big bits of what he assured me was Bristol board. He was a Bristol MP, so it would be. And so he goes to the palace to show them to her. So he's shown in. And he spreads them all out on the floor. And they're both kneeling down on the floor, looking at these drawings that Tony's had made of what these stamps would look like. And she looks at them. She says, Mr. Ben, you appear to have removed my head. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so th she then went on to assure him she had no problem with these stamps mm. without her head on, and it would all be fine. And she was very interested in them. And, admired the design and the work. 
and he went away, and that was the last that was ever heard or said about any of it. I'm sure, yeah. No need for, no need for the guillotine, perhaps. Um, as, a, as a former leader of the Labour Party, Jim, <coughs> what's your conference diary looking like this year? What are you oh, up to? Pr pretty busy. Um, usual round of meetings, Tribune rally, uh, various peace meetings, and event we're holding on Saturday on the Ford inquiry, and a lot of stuff in the world transformed. And it's great to be in Liverpool once again. Always. My favourite city. It's a good city. Sure I'm not. sorry about all the other cities out there. No offence, but Liverpool is a bit special. I'm not sure it's my favourite. Belfast, Glasgow, good ones as well. Um, tell us about the event on Saturday, about the Ford Report. What's well, happening there? we're doing a seminar on the, on the Ford Report, um, which was eventually produced, and um, a number of people are going to be speaking on that about their experiences um, in the, in the Labour Party and the significance of the Ford Report. It took an awful long time to come out. Um, I made a submission to it, a very lengthy submission, as did the team of people in my office at the time, particularly those that were responsible for uh, planning and actioning the general election campaigns in 2017 and 2019. And um, I think, quite honestly, it is not perfect in my view because it does tend to say there was somehow or other an equivalence between those people who spent a great deal of time undermining or being critical of what I was trying to do in the party and my team uh, I'd appointed um, as though there was an equivalence between them. There isn't. We had a democratic mandate of 300,000 votes in the 2016 leadership election result of party members and union supporters um, and we had the authority to lead the party. I know that the Parliamentary Labour Party were very hostile to me, they indeed passed a motion of no confidence in me, um, which um, I pointed out to them they had no authority to do because my um, mandate came from a wider electorate than that. Um, and so I don't think there is an equivalence and I do think that the Ford inquiry could and should be a lot more critical of those that were undermining and which the um, leaked report indicates, um, well frankly, the vile language that was used to describe individuals such as Diane, such yeah. as Carrie Mur Diane Abbott, Carrie Murphy uh, and others. And so to me, in that sense, it's wrong. But what it does show is the fundamental issue that I was trying to promote community organising in the party because I wanted our party to be A, much bigger, and B, actually I'm a great traditionalist. This is the 1918 tradition of expanding the party membership and making it a community organised base. Hence the community organisers, which I wanted to appoint, and eventually we did, to turn the party into a community organising party so that we don't just turn up at election times and say, OK guys, there's an election coming up, um, vote for us. Uh, we'll manage things differently or better than the other side. It's actually about giving voice to the voiceless in our society, giving voice to the frustrations of the, of the poorest, of the young of those that are really up against it. And we um, managed to eventually appoint community organisers. But what the Ford report does concede is the monumental levels of opposition I had towards doing that. Um, and the way we eventually did appoint community organisers, most of them during 2019. And they worked incredibly hard and did again increase membership and so our membership was by the time I ceased to be the leader was 600,000 members largest political party in Europe I thought that was an incredible achievement and by the way there was a massive surplus in the bank and all debts had been paid and so um, Dennis Skinner often reminds me and others he said you're the first and only Labour leader ever to leave the party better off when you ceased to be leader than when you were first appointed. Perhaps a different picture in terms of the finances and the membership of the party now. Um, were you surprised at all by the findings of the report? Because it talks about factionalism, it talks about internal opposition in the Labour Party. I suspect you had a sense that that was going on. You didn't need the report to confirm that it was happening. Yes, obviously I had a sense it was going on, particularly after the 2017 election. And um, 
the degree of, um, how shall I put it, opaqueness in the way in which the bureaucracy of the party operates by not properly informing me what was going on. And also, the advice I was being given during the 2017 election and the allocation of resources is a key issue. Now, as far as I was concerned, and I want to be very clear about this, there were marginal seats we needed to gain. There were seats that I was worried we could lose on the basis that the Labour majority in what are now termed the Red Wall streets, by the way, I think the word Red Wall is a Daily Mail invention, so I try not to use it, um, was that the Labour vote in those had been going down for a very long time. It didn't all happen in uh, 2019. Well, it happened, 90, you can it happened a long time yeah. ago. I think back to when I was first elected to Parliament, for where we are now, this constituency, my majority was about 5,000 um, on less than 50% of the vote. The equivalent would be what is now John Trickett's constituency, Hemsworth, which then had a Labour majority of about 35,000, something like that, who was the, seen as the strongest, safest seat in the, in the whole country. It's now the opposite. My majority here at the last election was um, almost 30,000. Uh, his majority was way, way down. Ian Lavery's majority was down to 800 in what had been seen as a traditional Labour seat. So it's not true to say it all happened in 2019. There was a trend in some of those seats. I was worried about that in the 2017 campaign, and we did, sadly, lose some seats in 2017. Mansfield, Walsall, Stoke, for example. Um, and so I think that um, we need to think about that. But during that campaign, I knew we were starting from a difficult base. I knew the opinion polls were putting us on 24% in April 2017. And the, the first message I got from the Parliamentary Labour Party, privately, from quite a lot of colleagues, none of whom had been very supportive in the past, was, well, you better resign now. And I said, well, thanks for your very helpful advice. I look forward to seeing you in, on the campaign. And by the way, I'll come to your constituency to support you, says I. And um, Obviously I didn't, and I just said to the team, look, we've got the fight of our lives on, let's go out and fight. And we went out there, and we had not very good local election results in May 2017. They weren't great. They weren't disastrous, but they weren't great. Um, and we then just went out on a campaign. Outdoor, mobilised, communities. I did 100 rallies all around the country. Mm -hmm. And they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, okay, people go to a rally because, in a sense, they are listening to what they want to hear and they're supporting the party they want to support. So you've got to be careful not to be carried away just by crowds and rallies. But there was something that was telling me they were massive. And something was telling me the people turning up to those rallies and turning up to campaign for us were people that had never been in a political party in their lives, never knocked on a door in their lives, never thought themselves as particularly political, but saw something in our magnificent manifesto, thank you Andrew Fisher, who's the main writer of it, for that, um, and they were going to campaign. And so I was talking to these people as much as I could. Obviously, it's quite difficult when you're running from event to event to event all day long, but you try and meet people of the widest variety you can. And uh, since it, all our journeys were undertaken by train, the train journeys were usually a long list of, long line rather, of passengers who'd come up and have a little chat and move on down the train, which was quite nice, but impossible to do anything else on the journey. But there you go. And then I get back to Southside. People that have been working for the party for years said, oh, terrible. You've got to stop giving any support to marginal seats. You've got to put all, this, all the resources into defending da, 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 da. Um, and you've got the strategy completely wrong and you're not listening to us properly. You don't really know what you're doing, blah, 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 blah. I said, look, sorry, I don't think you lot get out enough. Why don't you just go to Battersea for an evening? It's not far. Go to Putney for an evening. Go to Milton Keynes. Go somewhere and just talk to people. No, no, we've read the data. We know what's going on. Okay. They read the Daily Mail, they read the Daily Express, and said all the papers are against us. I said, well, that's not new, is it? 
I've never, I can hardly remember an election when most papers are not to some degree hostile to Labour. Anyway, um, I didn't take this advice and then uh, later on we discovered the whole Ergen House project. We discovered the amount of resources and money that was spent on that, not just the money that was allocated to certain constituencies without my knowledge or authority, and certainly without the knowledge or authority of those I'd appointed to run the election campaign. Um, and uh, that, those resources were put there. And you know what? Pretty well all of the seats that they claim were at risk ended up with massive majorities and a huge swing to Labour. Maybe we should have put a bit more money into places like Milton Keynes, Bath and so on, and Bristol and all the West of England seats and so on. Maybe there's a lot more we could have done to win more of those seats. But when you're the leader of the party, you've got a huge responsibility to be out campaigning, travel the whole country. And the time you can spend on all the details is quite limited, so you rely on others. I've got absolute confidence in what John McDonald, what Ian Lavery and John Trickett and so on were doing. I've got no problem with them. But they were not being told the whole story by people. And Ford alludes to all of this, but is not, in my view, categorical enough about it. We'll come to, uh, in a moment, that sort of discussion about rallies, because there's a nascent political movement in the UK right now that bears comparison, but we'll come to that in a second. Um, We've spoken so far about aspects of the report that are sort of critical of your opponents within the Labour Party, but it would be remiss not to mention that there are aspects of it that are critical of yourself and your side of the party as well, particularly in relation to anti-Semitism and other, other aspects of discrimination and prejudice within the Labour Party. What's your response to, to those parts of the report? Racism is an evil in our society, a total evil. And to falsely accuse somebody of any kind of racism is a major dishonest and dishonourable thing to do. I was brought up an anti-racist. I've been an anti-racist all my life. I will die an anti-racist. And when I discovered there were a small number of cases where people were using anti-Semitic abuse and anti-Semitic tropes against people, I was appalled and said, we have to have a process for dealing with this, as with any other racism within the party. There's no hierarchy of racism. There is racism. Express itself in different forms, but it's still racism. And so I um, then asked Shami Chakrabarti to mount an inquiry into this, which she did. And she wrote, I think, a very useful and interesting report, which wanted a, disciplinary measures, but also wanted education measures within the party to, so that people could realise what was an anti-Semitic trope, what was abusive of, of people. And she wrote that report at my request, but I didn't write it, she wrote it, it was her report. I never saw it until the, um, the day it was produced. I didn't get to read it in advance to discuss with it, its contents with her. That was her report. And that's important because I also wanted to develop a process where the leadership was separate from any disciplinary process within the party. Because I discovered on becoming leader that any disciplinary action was actually subject to the um, nod or refusal of the leader's office. Uh, and I said, well, this is absurd. I cannot possibly know every individual case around the whole country where somebody either deserves or doesn't disciplinary action being taken against them because of their behaviour. So there has to be a proper process of independence, a bit like the independence of political process from a legal process. Um, and so I insisted on that. It took a bit longer to get fully in place than I expected, but we did get that in place, and that's the whole principle behind it. And so when the EHRC report came out, I made a statement about it, which was, first of all, I accepted and welcomed the EHRC report. I accepted and welcomed the need for rule change to implement the EHRC report. And thirdly, I said that there had been cases where the degree of anti-Semitism had been exaggerated for political purposes and they were not 
true of the whole nature of the parliamentary, not parliamentary, the whole nature of the Labour Party and the numbers of cases involved was actually very small. Why did I say that? Because I didn't want the public out there to think that the whole Labour Party was riddled with racists and anti-Semites. It's not. 99.9% .9 of Labour members are decent, good people who do not believe in any form of racism or a hierarchy of racism. I think they must be supported and defended. And in relation to that hierarchy you've just mentioned, that's also something that's mentioned in the Ford report, yes. isn't it? In, yeah. the, in the consequences and the actions that have happened since you've left the Labour Party, it's highlighted a level of interest and response, let's say, to alleged allegations of anti-Semitism, and, and it was highlighted that, that hasn't carried over to yeah. other aspects of racial discrimination in the Labour Party. And their description of the Labour Party staff as the equivalent to a civil service, well, a civil service has to be um, objective, professional and independent in the sense that it's meant to carry out the functions which it's required. That's what our civil service is set up to achieve. Now, I'm not saying that it's all perfect. It certainly isn't, but I think we need a bit more of that. And when I find through the leaked report the allegations that were made against a number of individuals, I'm shocked at the language that was used. Shocking. Diane Abbott being accused of stuff that she was, Emily Thornberry, Dawn Butler, many others. Yeah, the quotes from the WhatsApp messages uh, in, in, in particular. Um, we were talking then just a second ago about uh, rallies in 2017, 2016. And, you know, I was, I was reporting on them back then and we've also now been covering the Enough is Enough rallies. And in fact, Politics Joe's political correspondent, Ava Evans, has been at a lot of them. And someone said to her recently, it feels like 2016, it feels like 2017, being at these rallies. And the comparison is obviously to Corbynism and the Labour Party back then. And let's park Corbynism. Oh, yeah. Socialism. Socialism, very good, yeah. You might not like that. It's an ism, I agree. Yeah, but any ism will change the, change the first part. Yeah, for sure. And then I, I've interviewed Mick Lynch, I've interviewed Eddie Dempsey, and I've you know, made the allegation to them that this looks like the beginning of a political movement. And they are insistent that it's not. Do you think that it, the Enough is Enough campaign, those rallies, could be the beginning of something? Perhaps, you know, a socialist party or a socialist movement that could challenge the Labour Party and drag it further to the left? Um, I think Mick Lynch is very clear that he wants the Enough is Enough campaign, as does Dave Ward, to be what it says. That is on the demands they put forward, public ownership and so on, which I absolutely agree with. But what they're doing is um, digging into a very rich vein of people across the whole country that feel very disillusioned at the moment and feel very left out of the political process. We have a deeply unequal society. We have more billionaires than ever in our society. We have more poverty and relative poverty than ever before within our society. And we have a bigger mental health crisis than ever in our society. They are all linked, these things. And so when the rail workers demand, actually very moderately, a pay increase in line with inflation, that's all, and job protection. When the postal workers do the same, when the teachers do the same, when the civil servants do the same, uh, they're not asking for that much, quite honestly. And the, so they've taken industrial action. But the way Mick Lynch and Dave Ward and Eddie Dempsey and others put it is very good because they say, look, our campaign is your campaign. Our campaign is to end food banks. Our campaign is to end poverty just as much as it is on our own wage campaign. And I think that um, this will lead to a strengthened political movement. Now, are the Labour Party going to listen to this movement, listen to these rallies, listen to what people are saying, or are they going to instead say, well, the most important thing is um, being responsible in running the economy, um, empowering the City of London and others in order to create more free market investment. I put forward public ownership of mail, rail, water and energy. I put forward National Investment Bank and Regional Investment Banks. I put forward Green Industrial Revolution. I put forward decent benefit increases. I put forward an end to discrimination on grounds of race or disability within our society. We set out the framework for a different and better inclusive society and an education system that didn't test to within an inch of a child's life 
but instead saw the strengths and abilities of that child in how their education developed. A political party of the left to succeed has got to be better than being a manager. It's got to offer inspiration. The interesting thing as well is a lot of the policies you've just mentioned have actually a very broad base of support amongst the British public. Oh yeah. And it's only in, once you get to the political class that that support diminishes. I mean, I'm quite shocked. I'm standing outside railway stations along with Mick Lynch and others and very well dressed and very well spoken people are coming out of the station and because they can't get a train <laughs> because it's a strike. And I sort of think, oh, here comes here full time. Handshake, Mr. Corbyn, you're quite right. Our railways should be owned by us. And these are people from the, the city. southeast home counties. Elsewhere, yeah. Um, we're starting to learn more. Suburban socialism. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was going to say champagne socialism, but I prefer sort of mojito Marxism, perhaps, I don't know. Um, yeah. We, you what? <laughs> <laughs> mojito Marxism, no? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Burrito Marxism. No, mojito, it's a cocktail. Oh, I don't drink. Uh, uh, there we go then. Um, <laughs> we're starting to learn more about Liz Truss's economic plans, economic model. We're seeing reduction in corporation tax, potentially a stamp duty holiday coming up, all of these sort of tax cutting measures, and also this huge stimulus in energy bills as well. What's your analysis of Trustonomics so far? Well, it's absurd. It's bonkers, quite honestly. The energy companies are coining it in like they've never coined it in before. They're so embarrassed by their wealth, they almost welcomed a windfall tax. They said, yeah, okay, we'll pay it, we'll pay it, because they know how well they're doing. Electricity bills and gas bills have roughly doubled in the last year, 91% increase, something like that. And so the regulator, I'm not quite sure what this regulator's function is, but it appears to be to make life easy for the companies. And so what the regulator has done is said, well, we'll hardwire in the increase you've got and we will, the government will now pay you to make sure you don't raise the prices for another two years, having already put them up by 100% on the basis of the allegations that gas and oil from Russia have gone up in price. The only problem with all this argument is we hardly buy anything from Russia anyway. Most of our gas comes from Norway, a bit that from Qatar, and the rest produced in Scotland or on the, off the east coast of England. And so um, it, it, that simply doesn't add up. This is a massive subsidy to the energy companies. My argument was public ownership so that the publicly owned corporation can be the moderator between the price that has to be paid. Yes, it has gone up, I accept it's gone up. But surely it's the function of the public ownership and the government to protect people from that increase. So they could do what France has done, which is to take the whole of EDF into public ownership and use that to limit price increases to, I think, 5% in France. A very small increase compared to everything that's happening here. Now, on the corporation tax, um, our argument was that the corporation tax should go up to the level it was under the previous Labour government, which would be 26%, um, which is broadly in terms of what happens uh, globally and internationally. The government is now proposing to drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. Even Boris Johnson was opposed to the last reduction, a further reduction in corporation tax, but Liz Truss is going further. So I hear myself from what I was saying in the last general election campaign saying this bargain basement Brexit that Boris is planning will actually end up with a bonfire of workers' rights, a bonfire of environmental protections, tax havens called free ports, massive profits for the biggest businesses, and a miserable time for the small businesses and the population as a whole. What Liz Truss is about to preside over is yet another redistribution of wealth and power in favour of the wealthiest, most buccaneer capitalists the world has ever seen. And um, that's what she's signing us up to. But you must be careful. The world is moving in a different direction. The left youth movements of Europe, of Latin America, of Asia, of the United States, are not thinking in terms of a free market economic future. They're thinking of a culturally diverse and stronger future. And so I'll tell you what, all the arguments for socialism are stronger than ever.
Jeremy Corbyn, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Arsenal are going to win the league this season? Fourth, at the worst. Well played. <laughs>